I see a raised hand from Sachin. Hi. So a uh, really nice talk. I enjoyed it. Um, I, I want to like, uh, uh, like I, I would like you to clarify this distinction of sessile and uh, motile. Um, so when you say sessile, it, it's that the cells divide and form this pattern and this motile, it moves and form the pattern. Is that how you distinguish them? Yes. So basically I distinguish them based on, on whether they move or not, like sp spoken very, very broadly. Uh, of course, and maybe that's uh, um, that's something that needs to be clarified. Motile organisms may also be influenced by demography and by reproduction, right? So, uh, in the case of aggregation that I shown, it happens on on, ta on time scale that is so fast that cells don't die; they 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 are able to remain alive for the whole process. Okay. But you you may think of 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 time scales in which you have movement feeding back to to reproduction as well. Okay, so it's kind of mixed. Both, both will happen. Like uh, in that case, you will have both division and also like uh, motion. Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, in in the example of um, in all these examples that I gave here, um, so it, it depends on the on the on, on on the features of the organism, whether it moves or not, and also on the time scale at which the self-organized process happens. Right. So. For instance, in the case of a starling flocks, the interactions within the flock and the way the flock moves is fast enough for birds not to die. Okay. But for instance, in the case of muscle beds, it is. And the case of muscle beds is, is super interesting because you actually, reproduction and movement happen on so different time scales that you have a nested pattern. So you have this huge pattern that you can see here that it's, uh, um, I don't know if you can see the scale, but uh, this black line is 25 meters. I very unfortunately uh, hit it, but basically oh, okay. this would be like uh, 200 meters, I would say more or less, the whole thing. And within each of these clumps of patterns that you see, uh, clumps of muscles, sorry, if you zoom in, they are also pattern. And those patterns are explained by, one is explained by phase separation. I don't know if you're a physicist, by like yeah. movement driven phase separation. And the other one is explained by a Turing activation inhibition principle. So that, that, that sample is, is pretty cool because of that, because it has phase separation on a small scale and activation inhibition on a, on a large one. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the audience for Ricardo? Michael. So I, I have many questions, but uh, I, I would maybe like to go back uh, um, to, to the example of um, the convolution between the topology yes. and the pattern formation. Mm -hmm. So as, 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 you, as, as you pointed out and, and showed that now the, the topography really really plays a role because it changes the distribution of, of the groundwater basically. So you have a lot of um, uh, uh, um, differences. Um, are the same patterns locally? So if you, if you take like, like a local patch, where the, where the ground is rather flat and you basically isolate it from the overall system. Does this still reproduce the flat surface patterns? That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a very, very good question. And the answer is we are looking at that. So, and not only in this case, there is, um, and this is a problem I'd say of the, uh, of the approach taken to study these vegetation patterns that is based on PDs. So vegetation is a field, it's a continuous, uh, uh, it's a continuous field, uh, but of course, in plants, individuals are very, I mean, they are discrete, right? And when you look into the patch uh, from, from the field point of view, so a coarse view of, of the patch, the, the patch in the topography case are like the spots. So you have like rounded uh, patches of vegetation in the bottom of these, of these small pools. Uh, basically, the, the whole idea, uh, being more uh, mathematical is that the topography induced some microadvection terms in the in the surface water, some runoff of water, and then it accumulates in the in the minimum of of the topography that can be as can be seen as a potential, and vegetation grows there, basically, and and then the growth is going to be, be is going to be um, covering the whole minimum of the of the of the of the pools. In the simulations, something that I observe analyzing the model mathematically 
is that sometimes you get like rings in the in the in the bottom of the of the topography depending on the on how the topography is so basically vegetation only accumulates in the in the in the borders of the pool we don't see that in data in data and in the images what we see is that the vegetation covers all the all the all the ground so basically we don't get labyrinths within the um within the pools of course if you fine tune i mean if you play with the intensity of the advection uh you do you, you do get some nested patterns in some in, in in for some parameter regime so for instance of course if advection is equal to zero you recover this case when advection is very tiny you may get for instance labyrinths in, in connecting the, the topography you, like uh, some some labyrinth forming uh on a large time scale and then some hotspot of vegetation in the in the in the minimum of the of the of the pools uh but for the intensity of the advection that we were able to measure in in this system uh this is what you get you get like a vegetation covering all the all the uh grounds of the of the pools and no vegetation outside mm -hmm. so this would basically uh correspond to those pools being being probably much smaller or of comparable size to to some uh, intrinsic length in the patterns if you if you would have probably a very shallow pool then you can kind of say okay everything is still flat of course it depends on 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 uh, on the groundwater situation but it would be interesting to see whether at least on on uh, for for some scale separation for example the patterns could still be used to um to infer, for example, the local topography or something to, to really see whether, whether you can get from this the topography data again or, or some, some similar things. So I really like this work. I, I, I really, really like the connection. I really like that you, that you said potential <laughs> as, a, as a physicist myself. <laughs> it's always, uh, always hard to address a, a broad audience, but um, yeah, those, Help me think. I mean, thinking in terms of potentials mm -hmm. always helps. Although I understand they're ecologists, and maybe if I tell them that this is a potential, uh, but yes, and that's uh, that, that's the key. So basically, the topography is including one more characteristic special scale in this system, uh, mm -hmm. besides the diffusions. And for some ranges between the advection, the diffusion, you may get that vegetation sees the topography as a flat, and then you you could get that. Again, looking at the ecosystem, we don't see that. Uh, these, uh, these pools are created by uh, cracking and expansion of the soils. So the mm. pools are very small, are less than a meter in, in, in okay. diameter. So that's, that's probably why we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't see it in, the, in data. In the, in the model, you, you can get them. If would, you... would this change for, for, uh, um, uh, for a situation where you have a lot of vegetation? So then again, maybe preventing some of the cracks uh, and, and keeping the soil together or something like that? So what we see is the other way around, that uh, the vegetation uh, tends to correlate with the location of the cracks. And I don't know if that's because of the action of the roots. We, well, we actually, Ruben Juanes, the, the engineering is, is trying to, to, to quantify that in experiments, trying to see how, if the idea is whether you can predict where the soil will crack. Uh, I work a little bit on that. The results are not even preliminary enough for me to give any conclusion, but basically we are working 1D, again, physicist approach, elastic material, and we are trying to apply different compressions and expansions to see whether how they crack or whether they have some different, some characteristic modes that are exciting and whether we can predict the, the characteristic scale of the, of the soil, which is what for us is going to be the important feedback with the vegetation. But that's, mm -hmm. if this is preliminary, that's like a, a little baby in 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 making so but that's okay. the direction that we are taking yes okay so, so i'm shutting up now and opening for others but i have more questions <laughs> <at one point. laughs> are there, thank you very much no thank you Michal. are there questions for ricardo from from anybody else in the audience um, don't see any raised hands oh throw one out there before we go back to Michael. <laughs> um, regarding the, the difference in the mechanism uh, that underpins the patterns, whether or not you have these Turing-like feedbacks or you have um, competition-only uh, pattern formation, 
what uh, what line of attack would you take to to sort of uh, to try to distinguish mechanistically between these two alternatives when you can't necessarily just get the the long term time series of imagery that 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 you would need what how, I mean the the implications of those two different uh, mechanisms are, are are quite different, especially from a management perspective. So, what can be done, in your opinion, to try to pin down which which one the truth is is, is closer to? So we, uh, uh, I think, one approach that can be done that doesn't require uh, any field work or any uh, experimental uh, approach is to actually review, uh, and this is something uh, we are uh, starting to, to, to think of doing, review all these vegetation patterns uh, where they've been found and, and look at the structure of the patches. So this is related to one of the Michal's questions before. So if competition is, uh, and this is something that is, uh, is, it's been known in other systems, if competition is the dominating force, interacting force, um, we should expect that each of these patches is created by only one individual, for instance, right? If there is no this kind of facilitation, it is very hard to think that one individual is going to be close to the other within these patches. Uh, usually when you have uh, in systems that are uh, dominated by repulsive forces or by competition forces, they tend to aggregate in this hexagonal lattice, but each of the nodes of the lattice is only one individual. And that's something that people have not measured. So no one has measured in these spots that I can show you, for instance, uh, I was showing, well, in the spots, <laughs> for instance, here, and although this is a computational uh, pattern, no one has measured whether this is one individual, whether this is a bunch of individuals. And I think that's going to give a lot of information uh, about the, the dominating forces, because um, if I, I'm pretty sure that if we have these spot patterns that are just over dispersed individuals, competition is probably going to be much stronger than facilitation. That's one approach that would be just uh, reading literature and, and trying to, to classify. Another approach that requires field work, and, that, and that's something that uh, I've been discussing with a grad student in Princeton for, for a few years, is to try to quantify these feedbacks on, on the field. So try to do controlled uh, manipulative experiments where you kind of measure uh, how plants grow as you move away from, from, from another individual. So for instance, in mind that you have this tree that I was showing here. And basically you, in control conditions, you plant plants uh, in this transect here, 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 and you see the fitness of those plants as you, as you move away. Uh, that would give an idea of whether the intensity of the feedbacks predicted by one model or the other, it's, it's, it's closer. But I think the most immediate approach I would take is to quantify the spots. I think quantify the spots to see if they are truly spots or to see if they are individuals. I think it's uh, it's going to give a lot of information and a lot of insights. It might be um, a, a, a case where higher resolution imagery would be would be helpful, um, which is available in some probably for some subset of these these systems like lidar based imagery. Um, maybe worth looking into. Yeah, so in, in the, 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 the first thing that we are doing is looking at uh, things that, I mean, uh, papers that have been published, people that have been measured these spots, and there's field studies of people uh, measuring patterns, but without looking into these questions. And then of course, yeah, if we get to really, want to really know how are these spots composed, we need to, uh, yeah, to get higher resolution images and analyze uh, canopies, how many canopies we have, and of course, that, that's going to be quite tricky depending on the species, no? because if you have grasses, for instance, these patterns also forming grasses, that's going to be trickier to distinguish. So how do you define? No? So I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky question, but I think uh, using these high resolution images and, and, quanti and, and going through literature is going to, to give a lot of insights. Other questions for Ricardo? Again, I... Don't see any hands raised. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Mike I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. I just had a, I just had a phone call. Phone call. Too many, too many media <laughs> at the same time. Um, so one, one of the, one of the interesting things is, and you, you pointed this out in the beginning, and we know this already, of course, that in principle you can always find, or, or you can define, uh, uh, PDEs that are linked to the patterns 
we're talking about. And, and usually just looking at a power spectrum or something like this, it's, it's, it's not so easy to infer the PDE if you don't know it. Yeah. So uh, one, one of the interesting things we're looking at and, and one of the interesting things that, that, that might be, might be uh, something to look at is of course to have a, have a broader look at the pattern Mm -hmm. uh, both statistically, but also, you know, in, in real density and, and, and things like this to uh, be able to maybe find classes of patterns that could be explained by classes of, of uh, certain PDEs. And, and doing something like this uh, could, for example, give me an opportunity to characterize a certain pattern and, and connect it to a certain PDE. So um, I, I know that there's a lot of work going on for, for basically surrogate modeling of, of uh, biological systems and, and understanding these systems from first principles. And many of these really incorporate the first principles that you know. So mm -hmm. local interaction or some mean field interaction. So they go, go basically often via an existing model and then basically try to fit the parameters of a certain PDE. But the other way around could also be that I look at the, at the mean at, 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 at a more statistical or more uh, global view of the system and try uh, from this to infer some of the characteristics of the system. Of course, this requires usually a lot of data as you, as you already pointed out, if you, if you do not have the full development of the, of the pattern uh, over certain parameter ranges, this probably will not work because different systems would lead to the same effect. But do you see any, any chance of uh, basically doing the inversion of the of the problem here and going from a going from a pure pattern point of view maybe with some more information on the on the uh, uh, on 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 the local interaction for example to describe a system easily just by its data and creating a PDE description of that. Yeah, that's a that's a very good uh, very good. So I don't know if I end if I understood it right, uh, basically the idea would be to try to infer the interactions all the way from, from, this, from the process and then try to connect it with some kind of uh, one of these instability types that we know these models have. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, I think that, that's an idea that I, I really love. And um, I don't know, I know I didn't put an extra slide. So at some point we were uh, working on some uh, aggregation process in, in insects and we were trying to do something like that. So we were trying to, that was a very crazy, luckily I, I only spent one summer on that because uh, it was very cool, but very, very, very hard. So basically we were trying to measure the, the kicking of the aggregation process to try to do um, some coarse graining to these insects, try to get the feel, uh, equation of the aggregation and try to measure the linear stability, basically the, 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 the perturbation growth rate that you would get if you were doing linear stability analysis to the model. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if I'm being clear. Uh, I don't know if, I think he froze. Yeah, it looks like he's frozen. Yeah. I don't think the connection any. is sucks right now. Ah, yeah, no, now you're back. I froze a bit, my internet connection sucked a bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I no, didn't so, get the last part. So what I was saying is that we were trying to, to, to record this uh, aggregation process and try to, to get the linear regime of the aggregation to try yeah. to reconstruct the perturbation growth rate and see whether it was in stability type one, stability type two. Uh, really hard really noisy uh, but I think it would be very very interesting I like that approach much uh, much more than for instance uh, other approaches that of course they are very interesting as well but that they try to measure like uh, individual level trajectories and see how uh, they can infer interactions from changes in the trajectory because then you still have to construct a PDE based on your uh, on your Langevin description if you want or your IBM 
what we were trying to do was to try to get the linear regime all the way experimentally and try to get the perturbation growth rate uh, from data. And then, okay, I can construct a universal, uh, like a, a, a normal, normal mode of, I mean, like a universality PDE for this instability that I can get from a textbook. And let's see how can I move forward. Um, we couldn't. Uh, I, I mean, of course, um, I don't think also we had the expertise to do that because we didn't have anyone that had worked with insects before. We didn't have anyone that was so, so it was more like a summer side project that I took at some point and, and I, I, I found, at least I could identify the, the bottlenecks of that approach, which I think it's always the first step to, to overcome them. But yeah, that's a very, very, uh, that would be a very nice uh, project too. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Sachin raised his hand. Yes. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. So uh, it's kindly kind of related. So uh, when you do the spatial analysis using this power spectrum, uh, mm -hmm. what information do you really get? Uh, is, is, does it really give you the the length scale, the characteristic length scale, or can you infer something more from the power spectrum? Um, so in this one, what we get is so, and I chose this example uh, on purpose. Uh, I don't know. I think you can see it in the screen. So this has like two different scales, no? It has these big points mm -hmm. uh, and this, then they, it has the small ones. The big ones, these are different colonies of insects. Um, so this is like a super regular pattern to, to, to get preliminary results. And basically what we get from this uh, radial, uh, radial power spectrum is the, the characteristic wavelengths of, of the pattern. So one would be this one mm -hmm. and the other one, uh, it's uh, almost on the tail because well, the cropping of the image was not the most, uh, Fortunate is this one uh, right here that you have a small peak here, mm -hmm. but that's so I, uh, yeah. I, I was wondering if you take something like a radial distribution function, uh, 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 then maybe you will get. I mean, you can then design an interaction, uh, a pairwise interaction, which can reproduce this kind of distribution. Uh, um, so there is okay. th there is work. Um, yes, there there is work. For instance. Uh, and I was not involved in that. That was by a work my, by my advisor, uh, Corina, and, and other collaborators, where they, but they didn't use this uh, remote, uh, remote technique. They, were to the, they went to the field and they measured distances between these colonies with, with, a, metri with a, a metric, so with a rule, okay. basically old school ecology. And, and they infer with that that colonies basically try to, to, to put themselves apart by a regular distance. And they infer that with the foraging needs of these insects. So basically these are termites and they live in nests, but when they need to find food, they go out and they forage around the nest. No, they are called uh, central place foragers. So basically when they find termites from their same nest, they are super nice to each other because they all come from the same uh, queen. But when they find other colonies, they fight. They are extremely aggressive with each other. They are very territorial. Um, so they could, for instance, uh, infer um, the range of those interactions based on the pattern, but uh, going to the field and, and spending a month in, which is very nice, spending a month in Kenya and, and measuring, measuring things up. But yeah, I mean, the thing is that once you measure this, you need to know, and that's why I, 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 that's a point that I, I wanted to emphasize. Once you, you know the properties of the pattern, you need to read about the system. You need to know what's going on. You need to mm -hmm. talk to people that have been there, hopefully so. Yeah. I, 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 now, I now know why, why some of the questions I was anticipating are not, are not being asked because the people I was uh, hoping would ask those questions are unfortunately not here. So all the X-ray Thompson scattering people are not here. <laughs> they know these Who be very well and know how to, <laughs> how to infer correlations from different scales. In <laughs> that would be that's very very sad that they are not here because uh, being I mean this is uh, this been uh, harsh of a time. I mean for me it's uh, I, I mean I work with Fourier analysis in in, in college, but. Um, Pretty much computationally, that was it. I mean, I know how to fully transform a pattern to look for regularities, but that's pretty much it. So it was uh, Breeze, Breeze, he's an astrophysicist and he works on a uh, spatial structure of galaxies and stars. So he was guiding uh, my computational tries and my, my learning process, but it, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, I think could be done 
that are far away from from what I know so far. So we have we have a we we, we will on on the eighth we will have a small workshop on inverse problems, which will include a lot of scattering problems. Actually, looking at the at the power spectrum, the the inverse. Uh, the the reciprocal space of a of a density distribution and inferring mm. certain characteristics of the system from it. Well, if you uh, actually just to complement that, the, I recently learned that there is another way to use the scattering for these patterns, but on a much smaller scale. So I don't know if well, uh, they recently opened here in Brazil like a very modern uh, synchro synchrotron um, in Campinas. And they are opening a soil chemistry branch, agricultural science branch, and they are measuring. Um, and, and I, I recently got involved in that collaboration, scattering on, on roots. So how is that roots? Uh, how you, can you measure the, the behavior, uh, the behavior of the roots by how they interact with phosphorus molecules? Like tiny, tiny scale. To me, of course, moving from these patterns to being able to do that tiny, tiny scale was like uh, heaven. So. I think there is yeah, a, yeah. Lot the, of, um, the, the, a lot of the, the scattering people have can can give you quite a lot of data, but it's also sometimes shabby. So, so don't <laughs> don't be too enthusiastic. Sometimes it takes a lot of, <laughs> lot of time also at these at these very controlled facilities to get to get good data from this. But of yeah. course, I mean it's a it's it's again a very 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 um, related approach to 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 looking at these systems in in some sense. Um, one, one of the things that that um, and and by the way, one of the things that you could be interested in, we have we have um, one group specifically uh, trying to use uh, physics-informed neural networks that are invertible for these kind of problems. So what they do is basically you put in a model, usually a PDE model that you learn, and from this you infer a certain power spectrum, let's call it for you a power spectrum here, the same thing that, that you're producing. And now what they do, because this is usually, uh, because the power spectrum does not have all the information that the real pattern has, uh, they try, uh, uh, this is a non-convex uh, um, uh, um, inverse problem. Okay, everybody's frozen. I'm not sure you're still hearing me. Yes, and here he is. You look frozen. I hope my internet connection is coming back. Yes, I know my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. So uh, what they do is basically in, in the same AI model, they do a forward calculation of the power spectrum depending on, on their model. But this model is also invertible. So once you can basically, you have a model that is, is explaining your pattern, you can put in data, the power spectrum, and from that infer the model parameters. So that's a very nice thing, thing to, to, to combine. And usually the problem here is that the inverse problem is a non-convex problem. So you can't really, you, you do not have, you have ambiguities. But then you've gone, for example, easily look in a higher uh, dimensional space if you have uh, similar solutions that are just, for example, different in the faiths, but but in nothing else, for example. So this might also be something to 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 uh, connect to and to look at. So, so basically, they have this PD model, and then they 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 train that they train a neural network with a model, or they they the 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 the, the neural network basically uh, uh, learns the model. So it's similar to a simulation for a specific mm -hmm. case. And then it predicts usually your observation, which would, for example, be your power spectrum. But the specific models they are using are invertible networks. So this means that I can also revert the model and basically put in a power spectrum, but then get the, the other uh, way around. Get the values of the model, the, 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 the starting parameters out, which is pretty nice. Especially if you are in in an ambiguous and and non-convex situation, so this is also pretty nice and and might might create some some connections here. Yeah, actually, for um, not I mean, looking at direct direct applications of that to this problem, one of the problems of these models is that parameterizing them is very hard. So, for instance, in these uh, reaction diffusion models. Um, uh, I, I remember having discussions for hours with a hydrologist in, in Princeton, 
um, that he was saying that all this was, he didn't buy any of this. He was like very strong in his arguments against these models because of the, sorry, because of the assumptions that they make about the diffusion of water. So he was saying like, look, I've been in these systems for my, he, for my, I don't know, my entire life. If you throw water, water goes down. The infiltration is all vertical. There is no, and he was like very, very strong on that. And, and, and it is because it is super hard to, to parameterize this. So how do you measure all these, all these, all these uh, parameters? Some of them are easy, others don't. So maybe with this approach, if you can give the pattern and, and it provides you an estimation of the parameters that would solve many, many headaches. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that would be very, very cool. Could, it could be something to, to, to look at further because I think that's, that's... I mean, at least you can also estimate whether you have, uh, uh, or in, partially you could also estimate if you have the right PDE or if you have all the patterns, you, uh, all the parameters you need. Yeah, there, I think the only point where you would need to be careful is precisely one of the points that I was making that uh, uh, from the pattern, uh, so it, would, it could be very easily that you give one pattern to this tool, it, she gives you some parameters, but the model, uh, so the, the, the interactions, right? Not, 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 so you are already assuming these interactions, uh, like for instance, this is scale defend, dependent feedback versus competition that uh, I was discussing. So I think that would be like a very nice way to combine this mechanistic approach with them using the, the tool to parameterize. I think that would be very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Good, thank you. Sachin, you're still raising your hand. Do you still have questions? Or? Yeah, I mean, if uh, no one else has a question, I would like to ask one more. Um, <laughs> I'll so, ask one after you then. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in the bacterial biofilm, um, uh, so if you mix the adhesive and the non-adhesive mutants, what, what patterns do you get in that case? If you, if you mix, sorry? If you mix the adhesive and the non-adhesive, uh, yes, medium. very good. Yeah, very good, very good question. Yeah, that's uh, th that actually when we studied this was because that case had been already uh, had been already studied. So in that case, there are uh, so the, the nice thing of make of keeping adhesiveness uh, equal among between the strains is that the mechanical forces are kind of symmetric if you want to think in that sense. So there is no way that one is going to push uh, more mm -hmm. than the other. If you have adhesive versus non-adhesive cells, what you find is that adhesive cells are going to be able to push the other ones out. And especially if you allow these biofilms to grow. Um, so remember, yes, you can see. Remember that we were studying this phase, yeah. but this phase is only the initiation of the, of the process. Then it grows in 3D and so on. And when it grows in, in 3D, then adhesiveness is a key, is a key, um, a key trait. Uh, what you observe is that, uh, and actually that paper was, uh, Karin Adel, he was the author of, of that paper, who is our collaborator uh, here. He found that adhesive cells were overrepresented on the top part of the, of the biofilm. So basically you can, uh, you can see where different levels of adhesiveness are in your biofilm. And of course, cells that are in the upper layers of the biofilm are the ones that are going to disperse first and are the ones that are going to have an advantage to colonize the new environment. So what, he, what, what they found was basically that adhesiveness allowed them to take the pole position for dispersal and therefore uh, gives them, um, gives them a, a, an advantage in terms of colonizing different environments. Okay, so they dominate kind of the dynamics at adhesive. Yes, yeah. but that's, um, I mean, that in general, I think in, that's a very interesting connection between uh, physics and biology. So when people study these self-organized processes, usually they assume um, individual homogeneity. So all the guys are identical, all my particles are identical. Mm -hmm. So studying these mixes and seeing whether things like, I don't know, spinoval decomposition of fluid separation processes and where do each of these types go if I don't have, I have a bubble of one surrounded by the other. I think in that there is a lot of physics and, and people from statistical physics can bring a lot of things to biology. That, uh, in questions that are not so 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 well understood. Mm -hmm. okay. So Ricardo, maybe I have, I have one one question. You already mentioned that you're doing the image analysis here, but of course, image analysis is is by itself a tricky business. So is that 
one of your core competences, or would you say um, if if you uh, can work together with people who are more into into the image analysis part, that would be helpful. Yes. So the I've done. Um... The things that I've shown, I've done them myself, but you, I mean, I don't know if there's any image analysis person in the room, uh, they will see that it's a very naive image analysis approach. So I learned what I need to do. I have no strong expertise on, mm -hmm. on it. What I really like doing, and I think uh, usually promotes uh, both, at least um, when I was interacting with Breeze, both my, my, my research on the questions that I want and also the, the research of the other person to develop uh, image analysis tools is to to interact with 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 people that really know how to do that. So, for instance, I know how to I don't know download a raster from from Google Maps, how to clean it up a little bit, how to run some dirty rush thing. But I'm far from being a an expert on that. So I'm more like a theoretician, a statistical physics, uh, nonlinear dynamics, rather than data science, machine learning. And I mean, I, I learn, I, I I know a little bit what I I know what I've needed. And I like reading, but um, it's it's not my my hardcore competence. This is very good because uh, in October we have a, a person starting who whose core competence is image analysis in for biological systems. So he's looking, well, he's using exactly AI techniques to to work with those images and and also build models. That would be amazing. <laughs> That would be a good coincidence. For exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, because in, I mean, I haven't gone through it, but in every single project that I discussed with you all uh, today, we had some point that was a bottleneck. Of course, for instance, I don't know, in this case, you see these cells are, they are amoebae. So amoebae, I don't know if you've seen amoebae before, but they are like far from being regular and like a and they are stick to each other and it's super. So how do you count them, for instance? That's a question. And to do that, uh, Fernando, who is the experimental uh, uh, person in this project, uh, he developed a pipeline uh, to be able to drain the cells, make them spheres. But then of course you need to still count, I don't know, a hundred of ones. So in every project, there's been some point where we were stuck for a time trying to learn a uh, technique to do it. So having someone with the skills would be, a uh, real dream, I'd say. Okay, I yeah. think I think we have some people who could help with that. It would be great. That let me great. Uh, let me throw out just a just kind of a thinking out loud kind of thing. Just thinking again about this um, transition to desertification under the two different uh, classes of mechanisms. The key difference is the abruptness of the transition and the existence or or non-existence of a hysteresis loop. I'm wondering if you could infer something about which class is more broadly correct by looking at historical reconstructions of the growth and contraction of deserts uh, wow. alongside historical reconstructions of the uh, amount of water available. Because desertification is going to be happening at the edge of deserts. If you're seeing deserts expand and contract, you, you should be able to get at whether or not that sort of hysteresis is there that's, you know, when it's time for the desert to contract. <coughs> I don't know if the data would be good enough to support that, but just by kind of flipping the problem around like that, it might be possible to get a more longer term historical perspective than focusing on individual places and watching them go through a series of transitions uh, that are captured in imagery. But just yeah, something to think about. Yeah, that's a very good point because one of the uh, main problems of to, to quantify this is precisely that uh, that that you don't have long term data on 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 tracking the changes in these patterns and way less in, in tracking the desertification. Uh, that could be one one example. Yeah, so, something else uh, that I forgot to, to mention before when you were asking is that the uh, so there is a lot of mathematical tools. Um, to, 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 to analyze how the vegetation time series changes as you move across this gradient. So all these early warning uh, indicators theory, like critical slowing down, uh, that is related to how the potential changes, sorry, how the potential that underlines the mathematical models <laughs> uh, changes in, in, in first order and second order phase, uh, phase transitions. 
Uh, for instance, critical slowing down basically tells you that when the system gets closer to the to the transition, it, it slows down. Also, how the resilience changes, so how the recovery of the system changes. Those properties are different in, in, in different models. And for that, you have more remote sense data. So we, we are trying to, well, we are very close actually to submit a paper where we measure all these things in, 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 in remote sense. Uh, sensing data, but it's also not conclusive. I mean, we, are, we, we put it together with analysis of this model and, they agree, and it agrees very well. But um, my impression is that some of them could also explain with, with these models. So there is still, I think space is very important there. I mean, that paper we don't really have uh, analyzed uh, changes in the spatial pattern through time. So maybe yeah, analyzing the fronts of the desert could be a very good idea to see, yeah. Basically, if there is some, yeah. Justin, Justin stole my question, but that is funny. <laughs> okay, um, we've gone way, way over time. Uh, is there any last wrap up question anyone wants to ask before we sign off? All right, uh, then I will say thank you again, Ricardo, for a super interesting uh, talk that provoked a lot of nice discussion. And uh, looking forward to future discussions and uh, hopefully having you here sometime uh, uh, sooner rather than later. We'll, we'll work on that. Thank yeah. you to everyone in the audience for joining. Yeah, thank you all for, well, thank you for the invitation and thank you all for all the very interesting questions and discussion. And yeah, I'm looking forward to being able to visit and being there soon. Yeah. All right. Take care. Have a nice day. Thank afternoon. you very much, everyone. You thank too. You. Bye, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.